between the wisdom passed down by ancient healing traditions, anecdotal experience, and modern clinical trials, one thing is clear. Mushrooms are medicinal powerhouses. And I finally found a brand, a product, a company that I feel really aligns with all of my research and understanding when it comes to the medicinal properties of mushrooms, and that is alchemy mushrooms. They grow their mushrooms in California on organic mushroom farms. They keep the whole mushroom in their supplements, and they actually blend mycelium and fruit body in their mushroom powders and capsules to give you the best of both worlds. You can learn more at Alchemy Mushrooms. That's A-L-C-H-E-M-I, alchemymushrooms.com. Use the discount code MUSHROOMHOUR for 20% off your order. Alchemy with an I, mushrooms.com. Hi there, welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're honored to be joined by Welsh wild food expert, Daniel Butler. Daniel is an environmental writer and wild food enthusiast, starting as a boy with ferreted rabbits and moving on to herbs and mushrooms in his 20s. He leads guided hedgerow and fungal forays from his Welsh small holding through the summer and autumn. Writing extensively on issues of foraging as a source of free food, Daniel aims to demystify edible plants and fungi to make them accessible to all. I'm excited to learn more about foraging in the Welsh countryside, how wild food can add new dimensions to our lives, and even some of the legal and conservation aspects that foragers consider as we enjoy the wild harvest. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us on the Mushroom Hour. You're very welcome. Well, it really is an honor to have you on. As we were just saying before the show, uh, you are a bit of a journalist, writer, and interviewer yourself. Yeah, I, I do a bit of that. I have been writing for a living, um, I suppose, for about the last 30 years. Sorry, there's a, a goth hawk on my fist, which is making a bit of a noise. Um, yeah, I've been writing for a living for 30 years now, and then I moved to the countryside, and suddenly everybody thought I was an expert. And so I, um, I started writing about birds and all sorts of things and mushrooms particularly mushrooms have been my passion for the last at least 25 26 years you know what is it about whales because this is something that comes through in your writing what is it about whales that makes it such a great mushroom habitat because i think here in the states we think of the uk as kind of one entity i mean we know there's separate cultures but you know it, geographically you know environmentally what makes whales such a great habitat for mushrooms it's comparable, but on a much smaller scale to the United States. Mm. Just as um, you know, the greatest area in the United States for wild fungi is your sort of area, the Pacific Northwest. It's right. damp and it's reasonably mild. That's the sort of thing that mushrooms like. Similarly, the west coast of Britain is also, because of the Atlantic, I mean, in your case, it's the Pacific. In our case, it's the Atlantic. and that moderates the climate a lot. And so consequently, the west coast of the British Isles tends to be, I mean, is basically very good for fungi. And I mean, it's, it's ironic that we in Britain, and in common actually with a lot of the United States for the similar cultural reasons, Anglo-Saxon cultures are really generally quite mycophobic. I mean, we're, we're frightened of mushrooms. We think they're all toadstools. And uh, this certainly goes in, in Britain. Right? And on the continent, of course, if you go to France or if you go to Poland or if you go to Italy or Spain or, or most of Central Europe, they're really into their mushrooms. And they think that everything is potentially edible unless they know that it's poisonous. Whereas we Anglo-Saxon cultures, predominantly Anglo-Saxon cultures, I'm, I'm not trying to blanket the whole of America in, in this sort of thing. But Anglo-Saxon cultures tend to be very distrustful of wild mushrooms. Actually, Britain, in common with the Pacific Northwest, has actually got this perfect climate for wild mushrooms. And we've actually got a much better climate for, for mushrooms than the famous mushroom cultures of Europe, like Italy or France or Poland. I mean, you know, in Eastern Europe, it's, it's too cold for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. In France and Italy, it's too dry for a lot of them. And so, as I say, in, in common with you and the Pacific Northwest, 
when you've got a sort of damp, mild climate, it's perfect. It makes the perfect conditions for fungi. Yes. Well, you refer to whales as the hidden gem of mushroom foraging. So is this a practice, you know, that a lot of people engage in? Is that mycophobia starting to transition? Because it is such a perfect environment, you think eventually people would loosen that fear and start to explore the wild bounty all around them. You would, wouldn't you? Um, it's loosening very slightly. I think it's more an interest in like organic food, uh, I mean, organic produce and a kind of relationship with your food origins and cutting down on food miles and things like that. But at the same time, I, I really can't say, can't say that um, there's been a burgeoning of competition in the woods. <laughs> I think uh, in, in the last 25 years, I have only twice met somebody who, who was also out looking for mushrooms. And it was, a, I mean, it was a very cordial kind of exchange of slightly guarded, but cordial exchange of information. Um, and in both cases, there was a couple and one of them was from Eastern Europe. Uh, and that, that's where the thing came. It, it wasn't the Welsh person, <laughs> the Welsh <laughs> husband in both cases. It was because they had a passionate, you know, kind of Russian or Czech wife, which is why they were actually out there in the woods. So, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't say that, you know, nobody is out, out there um, at fisticuffs at dawn, you know, fighting over <laughs> territory. Well, that's a little bit different than here in uh, Northern California where I am. You know, you go to some of the state parks where foraging uh, is legal and lawful even without a permit. And, you know, you're running into people pretty much everywhere you go in the woods. So I, I don't want to let the secret out too much on whales, but it sounds like it is still a, a very uh, virgin territory for foragers and mushroom hunters there. Now, you said that, you know, your kind of colleagues in the writing world assumed that once Daniel moved to the country, he is now this expert on all things country and wild food. But what was that process really like for you? You know, how did you pick up the skills and knowledge about wild food in this area, whether that was groups, individual people, just your own kind of autodidactic practice? How did you pick up these skills and become an expert forager? Well, I think that um, that's a really good question because, I mean, because Britain so lacks a mushroom culture, you kind of have to be self-taught. You certainly did 25 years ago. There's a bit more availability of, of sort of help nowadays. In my case, I, I kind of grew up always wanting to be self-sufficient and to live off the land and all this sort of thing. My, I come from a very academic background. My parents were both Oxford dons, and mm. but I, I still spent quite a lot of time in the countryside and, and wanted to, to grow my own food and all that sort of thing. And after doing a history degree at Cambridge, I, I then kind of wandered into journalism and then suddenly discovered that as a freelance journalist, I could actually live anywhere I wanted to. A bit like yourself. I mean, you know, I could be in Northern California. I didn't need to be in Los Angeles or San Francisco or something. I mean, you, you could be outside the main centers. And this is actually pre, this is pre-internet. Um, you know, this is pre-email. But it still was possible at that point. And when I moved here, I mean, about the first thing that happened, I'm mean, literally two days after I got here. And this is a Welsh mountain side house. I and mean, it's a 1100 foot upper Welsh mountain. It gets very cold in winter, but not as cold as most bits of the United States. We shouldn't overdo that. <laughs> but, you know, it, uh, I moved up here and I was in the middle of nowhere. And three days after I got here, somebody said, oh, you live in the countryside. Can you write an article about birds for me? So I've written article about birds, but I, I was still very much interested in, in producing my own food. And so to get back to your original question, six months later, just after the birth of my son, my oldest son, these mushrooms started popping up on the lawn. Now, uh. you almost I don't know whether you have the same exactly the same species in America as we do here, but they're called parasol mushroom. That's uh, macro lapiota procera is the Latin name. And I'm sure that you have, some, you, if you don't have exactly that species, you'll have something almost the same. And it looks like a, a, a 19th century lady's um, umbrella, a parasol. A striking mushroom, you can't miss it. Yeah, yeah it, it's quite it's quite big and it's it's got little sort of flakes on the 
cap and I mean, basically there's nothing else that looks like it and it is extremely right. edible and so I sort of saw this thing coming up on the lawn and I thought oh I wonder if they're what I think they are and I kind of looked at one reference book and then I looked at another reference book and then I looked at another reference book and so I finally plucked up the courage to eat them and they were fantastic right uh, really yes. really good eating and that sort of how it progressed is that I, I slowly built up one species after another species after another species, you know, tasting a little bit of each one and then waiting until the next morning to find out whether I was dead or not and wasn't. <laughs> and so I kind of built up a repertoire. Now, I mean, I've got a friend um, who's another professional forager who I think you've had dealings with, Lisa. And... I think she's eaten something like 260 species of British mushroom. Wildly adventurous, yeah. Yes, she's quite adventurous. I mean, she she kind of pushes the the thing a bit. I mean, I'm I'm probably up to only 60 or so. And in fact, nowadays, even though I've eaten 60 species of edible mushroom um, from Britain, I actually only bother to collect probably a dozen. I mean, you know, just the ones that I like most. Right, and I think this is this is one of the things about collecting wild fungi, is that you want to, you know, don't bother going out on a kind of gung ho basis of of eating everything that you possibly can. Well, I mean, you can start off like that, um, but after a while, just concentrate on it. So I'm I'm now cutting back to your original question. One of the things about wild mushrooms, which I think is really important which is unlike a lot of other foraged foods, particularly mm. plants. There are quite a lot of plants which are technically edible, but the reason that when you go to the store that you buy spinach rather than some green leaf that you could pick in the hedgerows around you or wherever is that um, spinach actually cultivated spinach tastes better than quite a lot of wild plants. Mm. The difference with fungi is that fungi cannot be cultivated. So right. with plants, we have managed a, a, as a species, we've managed to, to tame and to cultivate a lot of plants and to produce something which is better, you know, be it kale or spinach or beetroot or whatever, which is better than, and, and wild carrot would be another example. I mean, a wild carrot is pretty awful, actually. <laughs> from. A cultivated carrot is much better. The difference with fungi is that you cannot cultivate them. And so consequently, if you want to eat porcini or reishi or whatever, I mean, um, you, you have to collect them from the wild because they just cannot be cultivated. And going back to, to another thing that you said, um, one of the things which, which has always fascinated me, you know, and I was just saying that, that there isn't any competition in Britain for fungi. I gather that I think it was during the 1980s, there was a thing called the Chanterelle Wars in Oregon, where, where several people actually got killed in kind of feuds over collecting patches. Yeah, and um, they, they then came in with a licensing system. And similarly, actually, I, I think in quite large areas in Europe, there are licensing systems because people get so possessive and angry <laughs> about collecting rights. Whereas, like I say, I mean, in in Britain, I mean, this is what, this is also one of the things which really fascinates me. I mean, as I say, my, my, my original degree was a history degree. And mm -hmm. I'm very interested as a result in kind of cultural differences between nations. Right. There was some fantastic stuff from America. Do you know about the Wassons? In yeah, the... Gordon Wasson and his wife. Yeah, Absolutely. early... Absolutely. No mycologists and explorers and botanists. Yeah, they were very prolific. And he kicked off when, when on his sort of honeymoon night, his wife went skipping into the woods in somewhere like Massachusetts. I mean, they were near Niagara Falls. Or I, I don't know where. I mean, they, they were somewhere up there in, in the, um, the northeast. And she went off picking mushrooms and cooked up a huge, great feast for them. And he became convinced as a good Anglo-Saxon she was Slavonic um, in origin, and he was Anglo-Saxon. And he was convinced that, that they were both going to die on their honeymoon <laughs> night. Of course. 
And then when they didn't die and he actually enjoyed the meal, he then became very fascinated by the cultural differences between East Europeans and Protestant Anglo-Saxons in terms of their attitudes towards mushrooms. And I find the same thing still fascinating. You know, to tease that thread, it's interesting to see that current running through where I am in Northern California, uh, which in the United States, probably not as prolific a mushroom hunting area as truly the Pacific Northwest, Washington and Oregon. But here in Northern California, you have some amazing mushroom hunting areas. And a lot of those areas center around communities from Eastern Europe. It's really interesting. You Even the names of some of these areas, the Russian River and Russian Gulch and these different areas. And it is a lot of Eastern European influence. Uh, and I've actually been told this by people who are a bit more, maybe not by trade, but a bit more knowledgeable about ethnomycology of just this area. And it was definitely Eastern European communities that moved in and really started this tradition of mushroom hunting that eventually kind of infected more people of a tr more traditional Anglo-Saxon background in Northern California. And that's part of the reason why we have such a robust mushroom hunting community is because of that cultural flow uh, from Eastern Europe. Yeah, I think that you're, you're completely right there. Um, and, and certainly in Britain, you know, we've had a huge influx of Poles and Romanians and Bulgarians in Britain over the last sort of 20 years, and they have made a big difference. Yeah, I think that the, one of the other things which is really interesting about this, which is actually on a tragic level, and this certainly affects California, is that because of globalization, you've got cultures from different parts of the world coming into other parts of the world. And one of the, there have been a series, and in fact, in California, there was one famous case about five years ago, with a whole load of Southeast Asian kind of care workers who came in to look after old people with dementia. And they went out into the grounds of the care home that they were in and saw all these wonderful mushrooms that they that looked just like the ones that they used to have when they were young. Hmm. And there is a cultivated mushroom in the south in the sort of semi-tropical Southeast Asia called the paddy straw mushroom, which looks just like a death cap. Oh God. And so there, in, until recently, there wasn't a problem about that, because if you lived in Southeast Asia, you'd never find a death cap because they grow in temperate forests of, you know, kind of the Northern Hemisphere. But when somebody who has grown up eating these wonderful paddy straw mushrooms, uh, which they buy on market stalls in Southeast Asia, finds the same mushroom, apparently, growing in the grounds of their care home, and cooks up a huge, great stew for it. That's not good for the residents. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a feeling I knew where that story was going, and it was not a good place. No, there, there, there have been, and there have been two or three very comparable incidents in Britain. I mean, Britain, we've had almost no mushroom poisonings for at least a century, but the three or four that we have had have all been within about the last ten years, and they've all been exactly the same thing: of picking a wild mushroom that looked like an edible mushroom. Now, does this speak to maybe the fact that having a stronger community or a stronger kind of a tradition around mushroom foraging that's a little more outspoken or a little more pronounced might help avoid this situation where you have a different culture coming in, they don't know, and they certainly don't have any guidance. You know, there's certainly not a robust community or some kind of knowledge base you can easily tap into when you come into a new area that has kind of this information about wild foods. I think that's changing a bit as mycological societies flourish here in America and things like that. But do you think that a possible solution could be, you know, having a more pronounced mushroom culture instead of kind of shuffling these things away and relegating them to kind of the weird and obscure, making it something a little more pronounced to help with that integration process as people move into the area, or do you think well, it's just going to be this? I think this... That what we need to do is is to take everything into proportion. I mean, like mm. I say, that there is this sort of Anglo-Saxon mycophobia, which, you know, I don't know quite how to put it. I mean, so how we put mushrooms up on a pedestal as if they are particularly poisonous. Now, right. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are one or two which are particularly poisonous, but there are literally tens of thousands which aren't. Now, if you 
in in my area i mean you don't really have hedges particularly in america but if you walk in my area if you walk down a a hedgerow around here in a a hundred yard stretch of hedgerow there will be half a dozen deadly poisonous plants which mm. you know like uh hemlock for example and right. um which is not the same as your tree hemlock but i mean yeah the drop wall uh, hemlock it, it is the it's what socrates committed suicide with and you've got black bryony and you've got deadly nightshade and you've got you, I mean, you've got all these plants and yeah. We're not worried about our kids walking past these things. We just tell them not to eat shiny berries that look like sweets. You know, I mean, we just take that for kind of granted. And yet, at the same time, you get you get some people who say, "You're kind of my two-year-old looked at a mushroom. Is he going to die now?" <laughs> you say, "No, he won't." You know, I mean, no. I mean, you're know, just. And quite a lot of the books, I mean, the expert guidebooks really do need to be taken to task. And I spend a lot of my mm. time trying to unwrite some of the stuff there. There are some books which suggest that if you put a death cat, and which, by the way, a death cat really does live up to its name. It's really, really horrible. Okay. And right. half, a death, half an adult death cat will probably kill an adult human, let alone a child. But there are, there are quite a lot of guidebooks that say if you accidentally... You know, if you see a death cap, wear gloves when you're touching it. No, you don't need to do that. And there are other ones which say if you accidentally put a death cap in your basket, when you get home and you find out your mistake, you have to throw everything away because the spores will have contaminated everything else and made them deadly poisonous. No, that's not true. That really is not true. OK, we just need to get kind of real with our you know, there are all these studies which, which have been done about how bad modern humans are at perceiving risk. Like, for example, supposing there is a great white shark cruising off the beaches of California. You are something like a thousand times more likely to be killed in a car accident driving to the beach <laughs> than you are right. swimming in, in the sea with the great white shark. You know, so... It's, it's that sort of thing that we need to do. We need to actually get a, a proper sense of perspective about risk. There are some mushrooms which are really, really poisonous, but there are very, very few of them. They're quite easily identified. Right. And I think even, you know, wild food experts, like you're saying, mushroom guidebooks have this air of what it sounds like you're saying, and maybe even undue caution that says, you know, if in doubt, assume everything's deadly poisonous and you know maybe that's not coming to grips with reality i mean i understand and i have it myself you know when people ask about mushrooms my number one thing is well if you're at all in doubt just throw it away it might be poisonous you know so maybe we need to have a little more measured approach and i love that analogy to plants because we don't have that same response to plants to just assume baseline deadly poisonous until told otherwise and I wonder what it is about mushrooms that elicits that kind of response, whether it is just the mystery, you know, even people who almost every quote unquote expert I talk to says, you know, I realize that I know nothing about these enigmatic organisms. So maybe it's that fear of, you know, the unknown. I don't want to tell someone something that turns out not to be true because there's so much to know about fungi that we don't know. Um, but I, I just wonder what it is about this organism that elicits such an overly precautionary approach to them. I mean, kind of going back to the plant analogy, I mentioned um, hemlock earlier, top water uh, hemlock. It's a member of the carrot family. And there are a lot of these carrot family members. And anybody who's grown carrots, you know what those little sort of from the um, ferny type leaves are like, <laughs> right? The, the carrot family has this. And quite a lot of them are edible. And quite a few of them are absolutely deadly poisonous. I think that, I mean, going back to your point, I mean, I think it, it's certainly true, if in doubt, throw it out is a sort of quite a good adage. I mean, yeah. I think you, you can quite safely go out picking a lot of um, wild fungi. But I mean, one of the statistics which I always give to, to people who come on, on my forays is that Britain, and this will be probably roughly speaking the same in California, I don't know, but... Britain has something like 10,000 species of fungi that you can see with the naked eye. 
I mean, there are a lot of microscopic ones, yeasts and things like that, that you can't see. But, but the ones that you can actually see, about 10,000. And of those, probably about 200 are edible. And about 50 are significantly poisonous. Actually, only about half a dozen are really, really poisonous. And so that means that there are another 10,000 which are neither one nor the other. It's like it's, you, you could... It's like walking out and, and eating grass. I mean, <laughs> you might get a stomach upset, but you're not dying. I mean, it, and it won't do you any good. It won't do you any bad and whatever. So, I mean, I think that, that, yeah, I mean, when I take people out, I try to concentrate on the two dozen species of really easy to identify edible mushrooms, which are not just easy to identify, but are also really good. Yes. That's important. Because, because there are another 200 which you can eat, which, I mean, frankly, I wouldn't bother with. But, you know, it depends what, what language, gastronomic language you're using. But, I mean, for example, here in, in Wales, porcini are one of the commonest, or seps, as they would be called in France or Catalonia. Porcini is, is the um, Italian name. Steinpilz is the German name. And I can't remember what the russian name is but it means basically the white one as in the pure one the good one mm. that is a really common mushroom you call it the king belit. that's right you call it the king belit. yes the king belit, a uh, prolific here in northern california as well exactly and it's really easy to identify with total certainty you're not going to poison yourself provided you have a, a tiny ounce of common sense and you avoid ones which have got a lot of red on them and things like that but you know basically yeah. it's very easy to identify with certainty and that's a fantastic mushroom to start with and you know quite possibly never go any further i mean just stick with that it's one of the other things which is brilliant about um the king belief is that it is actually probably better when it's been dried and preserved than it is when it's actually fresh. I definitely agree with that. That, yeah. that that's I mean, you know, a little bit controversial. You know, if you find a really perfect baby specimen, it seems a little bit of a crime to dry it. But at the same time, you know, to eat it fresh with garlic and butter, you know, I mean but the bigger, more mature samples are actually better when they've been dried because the the taste is totally transformed it stops being when it's fresh it's like a superior mushroom i mean a superior cultivated mushroom it's comparable to something that you could buy in a store but if you if you dry it it becomes much more like um pine nuts or hazelnuts it, it becomes it, it, achieve, it assumes a sort of nutty flavor which is very different from a sort of mushroom flavor. Well, you can sort of see the link when you eat it, but it's definitely different. So consequently, I mean, I, I pick two or 300 weight of porcini every autumn, which I dry, and that takes me about a week or two. Then I get Ridiculous. bored of it. So I, I, stop, <laughs> I stop doing it. Because I don't sell it. I mean, I don't sell them. I just use them for my own purposes. And so, so I, I, I just stopped doing it after, after a while. In this context of a culture kind of mired in mycophobia, how did your transition out of urban environments more to, as you put it, the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of nature, how did that transform your appreciation of this potential wild food resource? How did that help you overcome mycophobia? I mean, how did that change you and help you engage more with mushrooms and wild fungi? Well, I think that it, it I'm, I'm a huge believer in hunting, and I use this in the very loosest possible sense of the word. I think that if you go out, you know, possibly with a gun, the most obvious one, or a fishing rod, which is another one, or alternatively with a camera or a pair of binoculars, or looking for mushrooms or looking for plants, whatever it is, if you're actually looking for something, you might be focused on one particular thing, but in the process, you will see so much more than what you actually went out to look for. I mean, I don't know if, I mean, the famous case was, was I, mean, I think Teddy Roosevelt once said something like, once upon a time, I used to study grizzly bears in order to shoot them. And now I shoot them in order to study them, if you see them, I, I, or, or maybe it's the other way around. But I mean, the point is, is that 
looking for something means that you will see so much more here in Wales um, and, and it would be the same anywhere in the States. You know, if you go out in the spring and you walk through a wood, your ears will be bombarded with bird song. Right. So many times I have friends coming here or whatever and, and they go out for a walk and you say, oh, did you see anything? No, no. You just walk through a bit of oak woodland. Yeah, it's not possible. And you didn't see anything. No. Did you hear anything? No. And and it's because they don't know the bird song. And if they knew the bird song, they would have would have been able to detect anything up to sort of fifty or sixty species of birds in the woods that they'd walk through. But because they because they don't know what they're looking for, if you see what I mean, or because they're not looking for anything. It's so engrossed in yeah. conversation that they just fail to appreciate it. And so similarly, I mean, I think that one of the best things you can do, I mean, let, let's get away from, I mean, the reason I, you know, I've just had a goshawk on my hand. And the reason that I fly goshawks is because I see so much more when I'm flying the goshawk and the goshawk is hunting. And the goshawk has got much better eyesight than me. And she sees things that I couldn't see. And she goes to something that I, didn't even know was there and all that sort of thing that's the hawk i don't train the hawk to hunt i mean the hawk just does it naturally but i mean one of the things i i would urge anybody to do is if you go for a walk even if you're a vegan take a pair of binoculars take a camera with you and try to see something try to photograph something and you in the process of doing that you will see so much more than you would have seen. The same thing goes, I mean, if in the fall, you're going for a walk in the woods, take a basket with you, take a knife, take a field guide, a mushroom field guide with you, and see what you can find. Suddenly, you won't just find mushrooms, you'll suddenly see a, you know, cardinal or a, I mean, you, you, you will see birds that you wouldn't have seen just simply because you're actually looking for things in the process. And this is such a transformational aspect of foraging where so many people I talk with see foraging as really this vehicle to transport people into nature and have people become more active participants and listeners in the natural world like you're describing so beautifully. And what I find interesting is in Britain, there is this big conversation that occurs around conservation and then foraging as these two separate things. So what is that relationship like, you know, with strict conservationism versus the kind of natural relationship you're talking about that occurs when you get out in the wild and start trying to interact with organisms, like through collecting wild food? You know, what is that relationship and why does it get a bit contentious in the UK? Because I don't think that happens as much here as over there. That's a very good point. And in fact, I, I, I completely agree with you. I, I think that there are many things that we in Europe have difficulties with about American sort of cultural attitudes. Donald Trump is, is not very popular over here, for example. However, not very popular where, here. You ha where you have a much more enlightened, it seems to me, attitude towards the outdoors is that Private property is is much less of an issue in the states. You have huge national parks and right. attitudes to that. And um, when it comes to things like hunting and things like that, you have a much more kind of, in European terms, liberal attitude. In Britain, there is a problem. I mean, that we're a we're not actually that crowded, but we are a comparatively densely populated island or set of islands. And, and we got rid of all our large mammals about 3,000 years ago. So the bears and the aurochs, which is a giant cow, and bison and lynx and wolves all disappeared, and wild boar all disappeared many centuries ago. And so we now have a rather sort of precious attitude towards the countryside, which is that um, we've just got to protect it. And when, of course, when it comes to picking mushrooms, picking mushrooms is entirely harmless. A mushroom is like an apple or, as you cited earlier, a blackberry. It is a fruiting body. 
in many cases, they're actually designed to be eaten. I mean, for example, a truffle, which grows underground, actually relies on something like a wild boar digging it up and eating it in order to move its spores from one bit of the forest to the other. I mean, they're, they're designed to be eaten. And by the time you see a mushroom, and a mushroom, of course, is only the fruiting body, which comes off the mycelium, which is like the right root structure. The root structure is there, the mycelium is there year after year after year. In some cases, I mean, there are some mycelia which are known. I think there's one in, it's either in Oregon or in Michigan, I can't remember which. There's a honey fungus, which is is thought to be tens of thousands of years old, right? Yes, the massive Oregon mushroom yeah. mass, yeah. Yeah, right, okay. And what happens is, is that every year, at the right time of year, it throws up the fruiting bodies that we know as mushrooms. Now, by the time you actually can see them, they've already opened up, and probably at least 50% of their millions, if not tens, if not thousands of millions of spores, will have disseminated. So picking that mushroom actually makes no difference at all. I mean, mushroom sporal reproduction is about the least efficient form of reproduction that you can possibly think of. It makes a human sperm's chances of hitting that over, I mean, spectacularly good, right? Right, makes it seem like a sure thing compared to, yeah, having spores land I mean, and it, germinate. It, it, sporal reproduction, I mean, to quote, you know, Sting from the police, every breath you take, you are breathing in thousands upon thousands of spores, even in the middle of winter, okay? This is just fantastically inefficient. So picking a few mushrooms is really, really not going to harm the ecosystem in any way, shape or form. And on the positive side, picking mushrooms, I think, encourages an interest and a love in the countryside. As I was saying earlier on, it encourages you to look and to get involved in the countryside. It encourages you to, to think about your surroundings. And um, as I said earlier on, I mean, you know, the vast majority of mushrooms are, are neither edible nor poisonous. But the fact that you're looking for the edible ones means that you will see all the little brown mushrooms and the poisonous ones. And you suddenly will see so much more than you would have seen if you just simply went for a, I don't know, a two hour hike across the countryside. And I guess on the other side of things, the which I think comes from a good impetus, which is to defend natural spaces, especially when you're on an island there that's been kind of the seat of culture for so long that humankind has kind of taken over much of the available land. That attitude to protect what's left at all costs is probably a good one. But I just wonder, is this something where it's a, a structure of institutional authority that says, you know, you can't pick mushrooms? Is it is it somewhat of a culture or a um, a tide in the collective kind of cultural consciousness where people, if they see you out foraging, say, oh my gosh, you're hurting the environment. Not that it's that foreign to me, but just so much of foraging culture here in the States is explicitly seen as a way by which people engage with the natural world and become these kind of stewards. And it's this entry point for people to become, you know, and this word can mean a lot of different things, but to become really conservationists or stewards through this early relationship with wild food, it makes people much more involved with the natural world. And I only make this point because I see that you've written articles. I've had pretty much every guest from the UK I've spoken with say that, you know, there's this constant push and pull between conservationists and people in the wild food community. So what is it about this that people who are on the strict conservation side aren't getting? Or is it, like I said, some just kind of faceless institutional rule that people enforce whether or not they kind of understand the complexity of the relationship you're laying out. You know, what, what is at the core of that? Well, I think it's, it's an interesting, I mean, it's a really interesting question that, and this, this goes back to the roots of one of the things which I'm most interested in, which is the cultural side of things. Amongst the British conservation movement, which I think is, is quite subtly different than the American one, is there is a sort of feeling that if only we could get rid of man, everything would be better. <laughs> which is a very naive and stupid thing, which is, I mean, you know, if you and 
your listeners can can kind of picture a European landscape, but particularly a British landscape. It's it's covered with hedgerows, and it's covered with little plantations, which were man-made plantations, and dry stone walls, and all the thing, and heather moors. All of these are man-made creations, right? And so the sort of idea that you could suddenly just pull out man out of the equation and everything would be better. But there is this sort of instinct within some of the conservation movement. And so consequently, they want to stop people from picking mushrooms because somehow that is harmful. It's, it, as I've said already, I mean, scientifically, it's not harmful. I'm also actually a great believer in encouraging people to enjoy the outdoors and the countryside. God knows we all spend far too much time in front of our screens at the moment. I think we should encourage people to get out there and enjoy the countryside. And that involves five senses. It's smelling, it's looking, it's listening, it's touching, and it's tasting. All of those things we ought to use to actually experience our surroundings better. And tasting is no more damaging than any of the others, you know? When it comes to plants, I mean, obviously, if you pick a flower and you stop it from fruiting and producing, you know, seeds or whatever, then if it's done to excess, then that's detrimental. But picking a mushroom is not not the same thing. The other thing that we have in Britain, which I think is actually rather more pernicious and, and actually slightly frightening, is that, as I say, Britain has a mycophobic culture. So your white Anglo-Saxon Britons or Celts speaking as somebody in Wales, we don't go out picking mushrooms. But those guys in boiler suits who've come across from Poland to work on our farms or to fix our plumbing cheaply, or their partners who are working in our care homes, wiping the bottoms of our ancient parents, in their time off, at their weekends, they like to do the traditional Polish thing of going into the woods and picking mushrooms. And there's a, there's a sort of dog in the manger attitude amongst quite a large part of the British population, which is, we don't want to pick mushrooms, but you're damn well not going to pick mushrooms, pick our mushrooms for us. You know, <laughs> leave them alone, you nasty foreigners. You know, they're our mushrooms, which we don't want. And there is an element of that in it. And I've, I've had run-ins in a couple of cases uh, in the New Forest, which is in Hampshire, which is in southern England, near Southampton, near London. And I think I'm going to have another big bust up with some people just outside London next autumn, because I actually wanted to create a row there. Creating a scene. Okay. Yes. This is activism through foraging. I'm loving this. Well, if, if you actually, here's another one, which I think um, in Britain, I mean, you know all about the Magna Carta in America. You guys, actually, Magna Carta wasn't particularly regarded as terribly important in Britain until about the time of the American Revolution. And then, you know, the founding fathers inflated Magna Carta, which is 1215, as I'm sure you will remember, into some great edifice. Magna Carta was basically a row between the barons, the aristocracy, and the king. It didn't really affect the common man. Three years later, there was a thing called the Charter of the Forest, which is actually much, much more important, because the Charter of the Forest gave the common man or woman the right to collect firewood, the right to walk along public footpaths, the right to do various things like that. Those were rights which were given to everybody not the baronial rights which were involved in Magna Carta. And in fact, I think that a lot of, if you were to trace back American legal history, you would find that the Charter of the Forest is actually much more important to you in America than Magna Carta was. I've never even heard of it. That's, yeah, that's astonishing. We've all, yeah, like you said, we've all heard of Magna Carta, but I've never heard of the Charter of the Forest. And it sounds like the Magna Carta may have been more about landed gentry kind of waving the banner of the common man, whereas the charter of the forest was actually for the, the common folk. Yeah, no, well, I, I mean, I think the best thing I can say now is um, 
go to Wikipedia and, and put in Charter of the Forest. Yeah. Right? There's quite a good, en- I mean, it's not a brilliant entry, but it, there's a pretty good entry there, which actually gives you the, the basics of it. But it, did, it gave the common people the right to do quite a lot of stuff in public spaces. And as I say, I, I think that you will find it would take a, a legal historian, an American legal historian, to actually sort of write a doctoral thesis about this. But I bet you they would find it was important. And this is an interesting cultural analysis because you're kind of tying the roots of how the general or how British culture kind of regards wild mushroom picking. And it's tied to things like artifacts of social stratification, landed elitism, if you will. That all kind of plays a role in the modern lens by which people examine mushroom foraging. Of course, a little bit of xenophobia sprinkled in there. Yeah, you're fleshing out a really interesting picture of how people in Britain may regard foraging and all the social factors going into that. Because from the insights you're laying about, about how it connects us with nature and all these beautiful things, it kind of seems so intuitive and so good. And, you know, of course, how could people not make that connection? But there are a lot of other factors at play. Well, I think that's right. I mean, and again, if we're going to do a comparative thing between America and and Britain, and actually even the continent, Land ownership is really, really important. Britain is is one of the most comprehensively privately owned kind of nations in the world, if you suit me. It's not a police state or anything, but at the same time, there isn't that much public land in Britain. And right. the last, well, basically since, well, since the late Middle Ages, most land in, in Britain has been owned by wealthy individuals. On the continent, things were slightly different. Although most land was owned by very, very rich aristocrats, they had a kind of peasant feudal system there, which meant that the aristocrat who owned, let us say, 10,000 acres of France also owned the thousand peasants that lived on it. Now, those thousand peasants were actually, well, serfs, as they were called, were actually allowed to wander around his land they and the land were kind of commonly owned, if you see what I mean, by the landowner. Whereas in Britain, since the Black Death in 1347, we had a breakdown of of our peasant system. And we very early turned into a wage economy. So peasants in the British countryside didn't belong to the land. They worked for the landowner for money, (laughs) if you see what I mean. And they weren't allowed to go anywhere they wanted to within the fiefdom. They were supposed to be working on, and they were paid to work on an allotted field. But they weren't allowed to wander into the wood next door. And as I say, in in America, because of the, the vastness of America, you know, it's a big country. And because of the relative, um, the relative recency of, of, um, well, particularly immigrant, in the form of European, predominantly Europeans coming in there and supplanting many of the native peoples. But there are lots of farms and ranches in America which are tens of thousands of acres. In Britain, no, that just doesn't (laughs) happen. right? Right, right. I mean, that implies a huge difference in the shaping of a culture, everything from its you know, considerations of how to view the natural world, even when you have that much more space, you know, it kind of gets down to how much land there is versus how many people there are. And that would make that would make massive changes in how that culture then develops and its attitudes around things like communal natural spaces and things like that. Well, I think that's completely true. I mean, you know, obviously, one hears of and I, you know, I can't speak with any personal authority, but, you know, one hears of these people who have huge ranches that have signs all over their place saying, kind of, keep out here or I'll shoot you or whatever. Yeah, no, that's true. That still happens, yeah. <laughs> it does happen. But you've also got, you know, let us say, along the Rockies, you know, just these vast areas of public woodland, of national parks, of things like that, where basically people can roam at will. In Britain, the amount of areas, I mean, the amount of land where you can roam at will is, I mean, there's still quite a lot of it. I mean, don't 
get me wrong, but it is very limited in comparison to the states. I mean, I, I would suggest that, you know, just one or two states in America, even California probably has more public land than the whole of Britain. And, you know, mind you, in Britain, you're not going to get a shot <laughs> if you wander onto somebody's <laughs> <laughs> private land. Well, I think what you're laying out kind of is this beautiful cultural backdrop of how things are approached on the European continent, how things are approached in Britain, how things are approached in America. So it's just interesting to see how these cultural threads come together to make an entirely different relationship with wild food. I mean, I think, of course, very similar in a lot of ways, but to me, the differences get get highlighted. And I think we're teasing out some of the reasons culturally. I mean, this is a very crude summary, but I think that if you want to put British Isles on one extreme and continental Europe on the other extreme, I would say that, that American attitudes towards foraging and, you know, the great outdoors is, is somewhere between the two, you know? Yeah. It depends a bit on, on where you're from. I mean, I, I don't know where one would put in Latinos or Afro-Caribbeans or or African Americans, I should say. There are all sorts of cultural differences in there. And within America, I'm sure that there are large chunks of America where you've got a really significant historic East European influx of people where foraging is much more popular. Well, it's interesting because I think America does have this layer of cross pollination of cultures, like you're saying, from South America, where I think. Actually, a lot of the work by Wasson and others has discovered undercurrents of a reverence for psychoactive mushrooms, particularly. And there are patches of culture that had interest in mushrooms. Uh, and then we have, you know, African cultures coming over that actually had, of course, a much more vigorous relationship with wild food. The indigenous cultures in America, of course, had a much deeper appreciation with wild foods. It's actually something we're still learning more and more about. There are groups here in America that are kind of pulling from records and history of these cultures to see their intimate relationship with all wild foods. And now we're discovering an intimate relationship likely with medicinal mushrooms and things as well. So yeah, we have our own kind of strange cross-pollination of all these different cultures co coming together which then would make sense how we'd be kind of in the middle of these two disparate, like you said, it's a bit crude, but these two disparate poles of, of culture that you find, you know, in Britain versus continental Europe. I think Europe. that, that the, the American attitude towards foraging is, as I say, it's a bit of a mishmash between the British suspicion of foraging and the sort of continental passion for foraging. And I think that, that you in America, because of the mix of heritages that you've got there, have, have got this, this wonderful mix, which is why it's not predictable. You know, this is such a fascinating topic as we're talking about this. Obviously, you're someone who's knowledgeable about history. So you're adding all these new perspectives into this conversation. Is this a field, and you may not know the answer to this question, and I guess this gets to the concept of ethnomycology, but do you think this is a field that has been explored? Do you know people that have done kind of explorations about this kind of wild food history or, or, or heritage? No, I don't really. I mean, I think, okay, I'm going to slightly blow my intro, but many years ago, I was trying to work out why the British were so mycophobic when the Continentals were in favor of it. Because I, I studied history at university and, and I particularly did 16th, 17th century thing where religion was all, all about it all. I developed yep. this really clever theory that the British were mycophobic was because they were Protestant. And hmm. they thought you actually, they had the, the Protestant work ethic. This is my theory. You know, whereas in Catholic Europe, you know, they just thought, oh, well, God will provide. All you have to do is go to confession once a week and everything will be okay. Whereas the Protestants thought you actually really had to, to earn your living. And I expounded it to a, a rather brilliant British um, food historian. And she listened very politely to me as I explained my theory. And she said, that's a really interesting theory, but it's complete bullshit, of course. And I, <laughs> and I said, why? And she said, well, look, you know, the Swedes, great big Lutheran country, they love their chanterelles. Oh, that's true. 
Uh, and she said, um, yeah, and, and the Catholics in Ireland, I mean, the most Catholic nation in Britain, uh, in Europe, and um, they're more microphobic than the Protestant Brits. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. He said, and where are you going to fit in the Slavonic churches of Eastern Europe? Right. And she said, it doesn't work, does it? No, it doesn't, does it? I then developed a rather more complicated theory which is all to do with the industrial revolution and well to cut a long story short the industrial revolution cut britain away from its contacts with the land mm. if you start putting lots and lots of people and somebody and there is a very good book called shroom by a guy called andy lechter which is all actually really about magic mushrooms but in it he makes a rather brilliant point that until relatively recently if you were interested in eating mushrooms, you had to get it orally, if you excuse me. Somebody had to teach you. Because until a hundred yes. years until a hundred years ago, there were no books on mushrooms. And what's more, most people were illiterate anyway. So what you did, as still actually to some extent happens in Eastern Europe, grandmothers would be babysitting their children. In the autumn, they'd take them into the woods. And they'd say, you can eat this one, you can't eat that one. You can eat this one, you can't eat that one. It's all done on an oral history basis. And my theory is that in Britain in particular, we lost that contact with the land. I mean, or most people, almost everybody lost that contact with the land something like three or 400 years ago. And again, if you're going to make a comparison with the United States, you have had this kind of pioneering history and tradition which encourages a contact with the land. Uh, and, and so I think that's, that's another reason why I think that you are, as far as I'm concerned, more progressive when it comes to foraging than I think we are in Britain. And of course, that makes sense that the root of it would be how connected are you to the land that would dictate your relationship to wild food? That makes all the sense in the world. Yes. And, and for all the the rights and wrongs of uh, you know american midwest history and and treatment of the indigenous peoples and all that sort of thing you know the early pioneers were always quite keen to learn from what they could from the people who'd been living there for tens of thousands of years so like i say i mean i put really crudely and like i say i'm i'm deep i'm talking in stereotypes which i don't really like doing and sweeping generalizations but i i think that america has got a generally speaking compared to britain a more progressive attitude towards foraging a more enlightened one and i don't think you're going to have nearly so you know, in britain the general attitude is if you go out and pick a wild mushroom and you eat it and you tell somebody that you've just eaten a wild mushroom there's a kind of look of horror and shock on their face i think that you'd get less of that in the states i'm sure that you get some of it <laughs> you know i mean obviously you're going to run into it somewhere but I, I think that there is a a more adventurous attitude towards foraging in the states than i think that you would get in in the united kingdom yes it integrates more with kind of this element of american culture that's more rustic and like you're saying connected with the wilds because and just having more space kind of allows people to be more connected it's just a really interesting conversation. I appreciate your caveats about generalizations because inevitably to talk within the confines of, you know, a one session about hour long podcast, we cannot adequately explain all the details, all the cultural influences. You know, as we're talking, there's a massive, of course, East Asian influence into America that have a much similar reverence to mushrooms as Eastern Europeans, you know, with whole towns in China being dedicated to certain mushrooms and things. Uh, so yes, America benefits a lot, and, and, but just those threads of different cultures that had appreciation for wild foods coming here, this frontiersmanship and expansion onto a much bigger natural environment kind of tempered the mycophobia and fear of mushroom foraging and things that probably was brought over by many of these British settlers to lead to a probably a more progressive foraging atmosphere in Britain. An incredibly interesting topic. I think your theory about folks in Britain becoming more disconnected from the land as things got more mechanized and more industrial makes a ton of intuitive sense uh, and is probably 
you know, a master's thesis or multiple somewhere in there for someone listening, maybe just to bring it back then to wild foods and where you are in Wales, I do want to touch on the major mushroom seasons there in Wales and maybe explaining what mushrooms you're finding and where just a little bit more about that wild food scene there in Wales, because it's an area until I came across your work, I hadn't had much exposure to. Well, I think that once you, again, is going to make a kind of comparison with the States because the British climate is so much milder, generally speaking. I mean, you know, we had, it was quite cold last week, you know, and it got down to minus 22 in Scotland last week. It was about minus 10 here in Wales, but that's nothing compared to the States. Right, okay. Basically, you can pick an edible wild mushroom every month in Britain without too much difficulty. Whereas I think that in you know huge areas of America, when you've got sort of two or three or four foot deep snow, you're really not going to find very many mushrooms. Okay. Right. However, I mean, if I was to, to describe a sort of sensible mushroom picking year, I would say the first really good edible mushrooms that come up here are probably in about March, there'd be morels, which you have in America in large quantities. There's, there is somewhere, and I've lost the address of it, there is somewhere, there's a fantastic website that you can sign up to, American website, which gives the location of forest fires from about two years ago. <laughs> because morels come up wherever there's, you know, if you've got alkaline soil and um, you've had a forest fire, about two years after the forest fire, morels will come up in huge numbers. And there are people who, who trek their way all the way up the Rockies going week by week, you know, kind of two or three or 400 miles further north each week in order to stay in touch with the morel season. Yes, absolutely. So yes, in March, March, the morels start coming up. Our next mushroom, which comes up is um, the St. George's mushroom, which is Calisibe gamboza. I don't know whether you've got it in America, but it's called St. George's mushroom because it's supposed to come up on St. George's day. It's, it's a sort of white, white gilled mushroom. Um, it's very good eating and it comes up in late April, early May. Then you start kicking into things like the chanterelles and chicken of the woods, field mushrooms and things like that. And then in August, you might start getting parasol mushrooms coming up. And then the main season kicks off starting at the end of August, early September. Mm. And that's when you get the big porcini the harvest coming up and that's when everything else just starts exploding left right and center and around here things are generally killed off by the first significant frost which is generally late october i mean there are still things which will come up after after that yeah but just not much but i mean you know kind of like my record was um, i went out on a I think it was the 5th of October, about 20 years ago, and I picked 34 edible species in one morning. Oh I mean, that was quite good, even by my standards, that was quite good. But generally speaking, as I said earlier, I, I nowadays, I, I don't really bother with the, the kind of variety. I just, I just pick the things that I, I really want, like the porcini, like the chanterelles, like hedgehog fungus, which is hindum repandum. And then with the bluets, which is the Lepista yeah. species, there are half a dozen of those. They come out after the first frost, so you can get them in, you certainly can get them in November and December, and I have picked them as late as February. But, you know, like I say, we, we, we've got a, a much milder climate than you. This goes back to the thing saying, saying that the west coast of the British Isles is really pretty damn good for mushrooms. Right. Just as um, you know, the west coast of the states is is also justly famous for it. Well, you're describing yeah, a six to seven month, maybe even longer mushroom foraging window, which I'd say is generous and sounds like a, a fantastic mushroom season. And I guess for you, as someone who's done this for decades in that area, I mean, it sounds like this is more than a hobby for you at this point. Do you see this as kind of one pillar? in being self-sufficient in the countryside is you need to have this relationship with food more than just, you know, a garnish to sprinkle on a pizza or something. I mean, is this a big part of 
your pantry or your diet even is is wild food adding to that well i think various things i would say here one is as i said earlier on i mean the thing about wild mushrooms is because they cannot be cultivated and several of them to give you a few examples truffles truffles can be yes. sort of be ranched but, but they can't be cultivated truffles and morels and chanterelles and porcini you know they have to grow in the wild and they are really choice ingredients they're not staples in the same way that for example a potato would be they are much more like a herb i mean they're they're a flavoring they're mm. like a, a herb or a spice most of them you use in relatively small quantities because they're actually quite indigestible i mean one of the commonest causes of, of so-called poisoning from wild mushrooms is not poisoning at all it's just that people eat too many of them and they're indigestible and so they get a tremendous bellyache and imagine that they're dying and they have a terrible time thinking that they're actually on the point of death because they've eaten a death cap or something and no no all they've done is they've just overdone it <laughs> And so I, I will always gather wild mushrooms every autumn. And as I said to you earlier, I mean, I gathered about 100 kilos and 200 pounds of porcini last summer, and I dried them. That was a very good year. And if I, I actually don't need to pick any for about another three years, because once they're dried, they, they last almost in, indefinitely. Right. In, and that's, that's as much as I need. The other side of it is how much do I see it as part of my life? I'm slightly daunted these days. But even though I've been professionally leading groups for 25 years, every year I realize how much less I knew than I thought I knew the previous year. There is just so much that I don't know. And the longer I do it, the more I know that I don't know, if you see what I mean. And, and it's, it's slightly intimidating. I just... Um, there's, one of my favorite phrases in life is the absolute certainty of the second rate mind. You know, people who, who know it all and who are forever telling you what the answer is. You just think you're not very clever, really, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm now 57 and I've been doing it for 25, 26 years or something. And um, I am daunted by how much more other people know than I do. So even in that area of Wales, you correct me here if I'm wrong, that the Elon Valley, even there, there's more and more to learn for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I had a, some years ago, I had a big row with, uh, with the ranger in the Elon Valley. And, um, and he announced proudly that there were at least 200 species of mushroom in the Elan Valley, which by this stage, I was getting really very cross with him. But I did just say, you are a, an idiot. <laughs> there are probably 8,000 species of, of mushroom in the Allen Valley, not 200. Why don't you go away and do a bit of research? Our relationship went downhill from there. I, I'm sensing, uh, I'm hearing a lot about rows with authority. Uh, I'm thinking you have a bit of that streak in you, Daniel. I'm not actually a very contentious, angry person at all. I'm probably one of the cuddliest and, and friendliest <laughs> people that you could imagine. Um, just occasionally, somebody gets on my goat and I, I go off. But I, no, I mean, I, I do have a particular thing. Um, silly people saying, you must not do this when A, it is completely legal, B, it is completely harmless, and C, it is quasi racist. So, so I, I kind of, I can go off on that. And in fact, the Ellen Valley Head Ranger would, would be one of those people. And what happened in the new forest would be another one. And the fight that I'm planning to pick in the Epping Forest, just as I London next autumn, will be another one of those things. But it has to tick all those three boxes, if you see what I mean. Absolutely. And I was going to ask you about future plans and this kind of contentious relationship with authority that doesn't seem to really understand the fundamentals of what is behind mushroom foraging and all of that. I mean, Tell us more about that, this event coming up in autumn and where this, I don't know if I want to call it a battle, but where this dispute is at this point uh, and kind of where you hope it's going or how it resolves. Well, I mean, one of the 
in the New Forest, which as I say is just outside Southampton, which is on the south coast of Britain, they tried, they put up signs all over the place saying mushroom picking is banned. And this goes back to the charter of the forest is they can't do that. This is 800 years of legal history that they're trying to, to unwrite. So I, I went and had a little bit of a battle with them and that might happen again. But what I'd like to do is actually something rather constructive rather than just simply picking a fight with people. I'm trying to suggest that instead of them putting up signs everywhere saying mushroom picking is banned, which has no legal validity at all. Right. What they should put up signs is saying, could you please pick the same weight of litter for every pound of mushrooms that you pick? I love that idea. Get people to clean up while they're out foraging. So, so right. You're out there, you're scouring the forest floor, you're looking for mushrooms. And there's a tin can here, and there's an empty crisp packet there, and there's a bit of plastic. And there's... Why don't you pick that up? And then you go back to the car and you say, look, I've got 10 pounds of litter. I've got 10 pounds of mushrooms. The world is a winner. Yes, absolutely. So, yes, no, I'm, I'm not completely cantankerous. <laughs> I would like to do something more constructive. And I would like to see, and this ties in again with the general theme about foraging, opening your eyes and making you more in tune with the countryside. So you can pick up all this plastic and all this litter and all this sort of general detritus whilst you're having fun looking for mushrooms, which is harmless to the environment. So you're doing good, 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 and no harm all at the same time. I mean, this would seem to be the perfect thing to bridge these two sides between conservation and wild food proponents is to do something that so obviously supports both ends. Now, is this something to be presented to you know legal authorities? And again, it's a little murky because we generally don't have an authority. There's kind of loose licensing systems in America or permits to pick mushrooms, but I and no one I know has ever had a run-in per se with authorities about this issue. So would this be a program you'd have to introduce to that local council or authority there? We're coming back yet again to kind of cultural differences and even mm. within the uk it's very very localized i mean like the the places that i go looking for mushrooms are commercial conifer plantations these are spruce sitka spruce and norwegian pine or whatever that were planted 30 or 40 years ago as like a giant field of wheat yeah. and they will all be clear felled i mean the wheat britain's really don't understand forestry <laughs> we we do it all on, as if it is a giant field of wheat or barley or something when I mean, you plant it and 50 years later you come in and you just chop the whole lot out but because of that you know these are all commercially managed and they're owned by the state uh, effectively uh, okay. so constantly picking mushrooms there is rather unusual within british terms just not really an issue because nobody can complain about it. Even if you think that picking a mushroom is harmful to the mushroom, which it isn't, and even if you think that, you say, well, hang on a minute, in two years time, you're gonna come in here and you're gonna chop all these trees down and they're all the mushrooms are gonna go anyway. So what the hell are you talking about? You know. So I have a slightly different thing here on, on that front. But yeah, no, I, mean, I would like to put forward a much more progressive attitude about foraging and about this way of encouraging people to kind of communicate with the world outside. I mean, just recently in Britain, last week, we had a huge, great, there's a thing which happens every year, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the equivalent of the Audubon Society, I suppose it would be, organizes a, a kind of great garden bird watch where people are encouraged to tick off the number of species in one hour that they see on their bird feeders in their garden. Sounds like a lot of fun. It's, it's a massive participation thing. And it's become, over the last 20 years, it's become hugely popular in Britain. And it's really fostered people's interest in wildlife. And I've got issues with it on, on different levels, but you know, 
it has definitely as a pr exercise it's done a huge amount of good and i think that foraging should fall into the same category where you just say can you not see how this is educational can you not see can you not take your child out into the countryside and say that is you mentioned it earlier that is a blackberry you can eat it try it it tastes good that is a as we call them well bilberries winberries I mean, encourage your children to know that these things are good to eat and they're interesting and they signal a particular time of year and it's that sense of you know the the italians have got this wonderful thing the slow food movement which is where you encourage eating seasonally and i think that we in in the sort of rich west and that goes for america as well as britain we are far too inclined to want to be able to eat strawberries 12 months of the year they yes. don't grow 12 months of the year not unless you ship them in from the other side of the world and if you grow your own strawberries and you don't buy them the first strawberry of the year in let us say early june tastes so much better <laughs> because you haven't eaten one for eight months you know and i i feel the same way to some extent about mushrooms i mean that come the end of um october i really don't want to see another mushroom again for about six months i'm really quite fed up with them <laughs> and then bang you know as far as i'm concerned it's it's next late april early may that the first st george's mushrooms come up and suddenly i'm all excited again because because it's i'm just reminded it's new it's fresh it's and and similarly the finding the first porcini of the year in mid-august gets me so excited two months later i'm really bored I mean, I just it's not exciting <laughs> two months later and i think this relationship with wild foods makes people more in tune like you're saying with those seasonal cycles and just to me it always comes back to getting more connected to the land and on this big more historical arc you know maybe this is a natural progression for folks there on the british isles to start reconnecting with the land and you know the the birding example is a terrific one so why not apply that to wild foods and it kind of does maybe the inverse of the original flow where people were connected with the land hence they found wild foods or wild animals and so maybe now by getting people more in touch with wild foods and wild animals you enhance that connection with the land and kind of rebuild that cycle that is even more tenuous in a world where we're like you said on our screens all day we're kind of these pitfalls of modern culture that kind of keep us in square boxes attached to a screen when really we need to get out and connect more with nature to kind of balance ourselves. So I think what you're describing of pushing efforts to give people more in tune is a big part of restoring that cycle that connects people with the land and hopefully can address some of the issues we're seeing of a hugely industrialized, technology-driven world. Yes, and I, I think that, that mushrooms are particularly good at doing what you've just described because they can't be cultivated. Yes. Because every porcini <laughs> that you've ever eaten from a dried packet in a delicatessen or whatever was picked in the wild probably in china or bulgaria but anyway i mean and they have to be and um and they are choice ingredients like i say you can go out and pick lots of green plants which are edible but the vast majority of them are let's face it not terribly exciting or good edible but forgettable there are exceptions. I mean, I'm not, not trying to make a totally sweeping thing here, but the vast majority of wild plants, you know, have been superseded by cultivated alternatives. However, mushrooms are different. If you want to eat a truffle, and a truffle has an utterly unique taste and flavour and all that sort of thing, if you want to eat a truffle, you have to get a truffle that either you or somebody else has collected from the wild. Same thing for porcini, same thing for chaga. Um, I don't, is it called chaga in America? It is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, anyway, there are all these all these wild mushrooms. Which, I mean, and we haven't really touched on, on the medicinal mushrooms, but there are some very good medicinal mushrooms. And, you know, they have to be collected from the wild. And I just think that, that that's, that's like a kind of bumper pack reward 
for the, the person who's left their computer screen. They've mm. ventured out of the house and they've wandered down the track looking at the hedgerows, looking at the fields, looking at the woods around them. And they suddenly find a wild mushroom and they, ooh, 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 I, I think that one's edible. It, it reminds me of something that's edible. And they sort of take it back and they stare at it and they bring out all the guidebooks and they compare it with, with three different guidebooks. And then they still a bit scared and they take it to the neighbor who, who does know about mushrooms. And, and the neighbor says, yeah, you can eat that. And they go back and very, very tentatively, they cut off a tiny little sliver and they cook it and they eat it. And I think, wow, where's <laughs> that come from? You know, right. so, um, I mean, so, so that's what I would, because the, the reward is so great. I think it's a bit like if you were to give somebody a pair of binoculars or a camera and told them to go out and the first thing they saw was a golden eagle or an osprey. <laughs> okay. And they just think, wow, what is that? You know, it's, you're getting the ultimate reward for your effort. And that's where I, I feel that mushrooms have a particularly valuable role to play. Yes, developing a relationship with mushrooms and edible mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms, typically necessitates a relationship with the natural world, with the wild in such a powerful way. And I know, you know, this is a common theme on the podcast. I think you elucidated it beautifully. I know it's had that effect on myself. And I know so many people that this relationship with wild mushrooms in particular, in particular, wild mushrooms seem to put us more in touch with ecology and understanding or wanting to understand nature better, if for no other reason than understanding better on where and when to find mushrooms. You know, we want to understand these natural cycles. And I think it is a very powerful portal through which people enter the natural world. Now, for you as someone who's a prolific educator, you know, how has that affected your own relationship with wild foods and with nature? I mean, what has that given to you to be able to open people up to this world of wild food that you know is going to eventually connect them? I mean, what's that been like for you to have a chance to be an educator for people about these subjects? Well, I mean, my, my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my great-great-great-grandparents, right? I mean, it, since literally before the American Revolution, my parents have all been academics. Oh, my grandparents, it's in the blood. Uh, yes, it is in the blood. So, so I'm, I, I kind of like the idea of educating. I also get a kick out of it in the sense that most people, particularly in Britain, are mycophobic. They don't know anything about mushrooms. So you take them out and you show them an edible mushroom and they taste it and they think, wow, that's interesting. I mean, normally on, when, when I typically take people out, we would gather probably a dozen, maybe two dozen edible species of mushroom. We come back here and they, they have a sort of tasting session and they taste all these mushrooms and they don't like them all. You know, nobody does ever. Inevitably. But it's opened their eyes to something that's really interesting. And then they go off. And, and I mean, this happened to me as well, is you start off by only being interested in something that you can eat. And then you start thinking, well, well, what, what is it in a mushroom? I mean, you know, kind of where am I going to find more of them? What makes them tick? How do they work? And you find out about the mycelium and you find out about the interaction that mushrooms have with plants. Something which a lot of people don't realize is that literally it's something like 99.9% .9 of plants could not exist without the mushrooms and the mycelium, which are wrapped around their roots. Because the fungi are very good at breaking things down. In fact, almost all decay starts. And this involves when you and I die. About the first thing that will happen is, is a mushroom will start breaking our cell walls <laughs> down. Okay. I mean, it's all a bit morbid, but at the same time, you know, decay starts with, generally speaking, with fungal action. Yes. And that breaks down the cell walls. And then the bacteria and the little microorganisms can get in to, and this goes for plants as well. One thing which I think is really interesting, which a lot of, again, a lot of people don't know is it's now thought that until about 300 million years ago, fungi were not capable of breaking down lignins, which those are the long cellulose chemicals in trees. In wood. Yeah, yeah. in wood. And so what happens is, so, so when these vast primeval forests 
were growing, when the trees tumbled over and fell on the ground, there was nothing to break them down. The fungi weren't there. The fungi couldn't do it. And so they went into the soil and they produced coal, oil and gas. And then about 300 million years ago, there was some sort of genetic twist and fungi managed to get the right kind of chemicals I mean, or, or set up in order to break down the lignans. And so this means that, that basically this is why there are no new fossil fuels being laid down now is because the fungi break them down. So we're not getting any new coal fields laid down now. We're not getting any more oil reserves laid down now because of fungi. Um, it's a fascinating idea to think about that prior to yeah fungi developing ligninolytic enzymes, you know, all of that biomass just kind of was sequestered away into our reserves of coal. And it is a fascinating idea. I've, I've heard the same theory. And, you know, I, I think there might be something to that. Well, I, I should say, um, I haven't read, I mean, this is something I've heard. I haven't read the proper papers. I don't know how far this is speculation and how far this is actually truth. So I, right. I, I'm just going to slightly distance myself from that one. Um, <laughs> but I did hear it from a credible source, if you see what I mean. But, and you're getting all the way to this fantastic theory through something as humble as an edible wild mushroom. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and but you'll have heard this thing. I mean, you know, the, what's it? Um, the wood wide web. I think that actually that is established that trees can communicate with each other via the mycelium wrapped around their roots, communicating yeah. with each other. That one, I, I, I'm on safer ground <laughs> saying it's true. <laughs> I, I think the, yeah. the fossil fuel thing, I think, does sound credible. Although some oil engineer who came on my forays a couple of years ago said, hang on a minute, you've still got seaweeds at the bottom of the sea. They could be building up future fossil fuel reserves because you don't have fungal action in salt water, generally speaking. This is something which, which I'm sure that your listeners uh, will happily write into you to correct me or you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it points out beautifully the point you're making, though, which is that if, when you introduce people to just something as powerful as this connection to something we like to eat, this edible mushroom we like to eat, suddenly you turn into Daniel, who's then researching theories about fossil fuels and wood wide web. All of that kind of goes hand in hand to this relationship with wild edible mushrooms. And you're able to send people on on that journey. Well, I hope so. I mean, I, I don't like to, I mean, I certainly don't like to proselytize to anybody, but I do get a real kick when, you know, I take out a couple of hundred people a year looking for edible mushrooms. And every uh, half a dozen of them really get infected <laughs> with the bug, you know, and they they start writing back to me. And there, there are several of them who now know an awful lot more than I do. I mean, they've really got into it. And that gives me a real kick to, yeah. to actually, to have suggested to somebody that something is interesting and for them to have really taken it up as a sort of bee in their bonnet that's brilliant what better reward could a teacher have if you sit i mean than a, a pupil getting really fascinated by it i certainly don't mind discovering that somebody that i introduced to mushrooms now knows much more than me and in fact in several cases i actually turn to them for advice and for help you know so say i, I found this mushroom i think it's this what do you think it is and when they know the answer, which I didn't know, that gives me such a buzz. Yeah, you're part of this beautiful cycle of learning and then teaching and learning and teaching. I mean, I'm always struck by that when I talk with wild food teachers is how much they're able to then participate in this cycle of creating more community and ultimately vastly expanding everyone's knowledge by inoculating or infecting other people with this same interest. So really fascinating stuff. Now, what are some, I know 2021, we're entering this year coming off the heels of, you know, global upheaval, like we've never seen it, but what are some plans, if you can project that far, what are some plans you have coming up here in the future uh, for this year? Well, like I say, I'm, I'm thinking of moving house to huh? a different area. Um, it would still be within Wales, but I mean, it'd be a different area. So that's going to be a big upheaval. 
but more more foraging related yeah like i said i think i want to kick off some noise um <laughs> about authorities sort of stupid reactions to foraging right and i want to try to and i hope to do it in a kind of constructive way i'm not going to be needless well i will be needlessly confrontational but for a purpose i want to try to get a lot of the powers that be in the uk to far from seeing foraging as being a kind of threat and, and a sort of damaging exercise but as seeing it as something which could be an educational tool it could be something and also as i said you know if we could pick up litter at the same time as picking mushrooms that seems to me to be constructive so i i, I would like it to be that and and other than that, what, what's my ambition? I, uh, my ambition, I suppose, would be next year or this year, this next coming autumn, I want to find a horn of plenty, Crassarellus cornucopius, uh, trompette de mort, as the French call it. You know, it's, it's the sort of little kind of grey brown black sort of little trumpet type relative of the chanterelle. Black trumpets, we call them here, yeah. Yeah. I have found them in Britain before, but I was always shown where to find them. That was in the New Forest. And I would like to find one locally in Wales. And I'd also like to find my first British morel. And they, again, they grow here, but I mean, Wales has got very, very acidic soil. So you're not going to find morels here. Interesting. So a quest for some elusive mushrooms. I think even the most veteran mushroom hunters, morels and black trumpets are some of the most elusive yet delicious edibles that we can find. Now, where can people connect more with your work, you know, especially for people living in Wales or living in the UK to engage with your classes and even maybe be part of this movement, this foraging resistance to help turn the tide of mycophobia? You know, where can people connect with you and maybe get involved with some of these initiatives? Well, you should be able to find me fairly easily. If you put my name, Daniel Butler, into Google with whales and wild mushrooms, you get me quite quickly. The actual official website is fungiforays.co.uk. But as I say, I think most people will probably find it easier just to, to Google whales and edible mushrooms and Daniel Butler, and you'll get me. I can verify if you type in Daniel Butler mushrooms and whales, there is no one else that pops up, and there are many articles <laughs> that you can read written by Daniel. There's your website, a fantastic kind of trove of information, really dealing with a lot of the topics we've talked about, obviously, in a format where you can expound a little bit more. And so I really encourage people to go check out your work. Obviously, if you're lucky enough to be in Wales, go enjoy the classes. And then I would hope that people listening who are in the foraging community would also find ways to support and get behind this movement to you know, change some of the institutional rigidity around attitudes of foraging that I think you're trying to do. I think it's a really great cause. Well, I guess I'll wrap things up with the three questions that I like to ask all of my guests. Uh, and the first one can cause some consternation and some real meditation to try to figure out what a good answer would be. Uh, but the first one is just a mushroom you love and why. And this can be as simple as the mushroom you're just inspired to think about in this moment, or maybe an all-time favorite, uh, but a mushroom you love and why? I think the greatest, the, the tastiest, the best mushrooms would have to be things like morels and truffles and things like that. But you know what? I, I find it very difficult to beat porcini. You know, hmm. finding a really big, perfect king belief is just the size of them, and they are they taste so good and they dry so well. And uh, yeah, I, so I think I would have to put them, even though, as I say, I, I would, in pure taste terms, I would put other mushrooms above them, but they, they are basically got to be tops. You can't go wrong with porcini. I think there's a historical idea that Romans actually used to use sep or porcini as a substitute for currency in some parts of the empire. And I think that speaks to how ubiquitous the love for porcini is and how uh, how widespread the affection for porcini is. And I think it's definitely well-placed. 
Now, this next question is a bit more expansive and you can go any direction you like with it. But what has this relationship with fungi that you've developed, how has that changed your life? I mean, what has that given to you? And this could be something spiritual, a new perspective, you know, or something else entirely. Right, okay, I, I think I would say uh, fungi, um, they've opened my eyes to a different level of the countryside. I mean, because I said before, I mean, I, I fly hawks and I have a very active spaniel and it's added a new, put it this way, it's added a new dimension to my countryside walks. It's also given me an expertise, which even though, as I said earlier, I, I get increasingly daunted by realizing how little I know about mushrooms. I certainly know an awful lot more about mushrooms than the vast majority of the British public, which isn't saying very much at all. So it's not a huge claim. I've written numerous articles about it. I've also got more and more interested in the non-edible aspects of fungi. I know that it's something that, I mean, it's wonderful. It, it's a world where I am always going to carry on learning. And um, I don't know, if, if you're a sort of a total model railway fanatic, there will come a point where you know everything that there is to be known about model railways. The fact that even the greatest mycological minds in the world don't know everything that there is to know about mushrooms is something which is a constant challenge and it's, it's fascinating. Well, it sounds like they've very much been that gateway, like we described, into a greater appreciation of the natural world. And I absolutely agree. And it's the reason why I had to start a podcast was to discuss the multitude of aspects of appreciation for kingdom fungi and mushrooms that are limitless. Uh, so I absolutely love that answer. And then uh, the final question, again, it's something expansive, but what is your what is your greatest hope for our future with mushrooms and fungi? You know, the world in 10 to 20 years, if we kind of use our relationship with these organisms to our highest potential, what's kind of your greatest hope about our future with mushrooms and fungi? Well, it's not something that I know very much about, but I suppose that one of the most exciting things which is going on at the moment is some of the pioneering work that there that is going on of making plastic substitutes out of fungi. And not just plastics, but, you know, kind of building blocks, insulation materials, biodegradable coffins. I mean, there are, there are so many things that hypothetically can be done with fungi. And fungi are also, after all, critical to all sorts of medicines. I mean, the most obvious example are the penicillins and, and antibiotics. But at the moment, they're being used in all sorts of things. I mean, like in washing powders, what do you call them? Bio powders, uh, whatever. The the enzymes used in our washing powders and detergents and things like that, they're manufactured by fungi. Yeah. And there are also, if I mean, I am a carnivore um, and will always stay stay as such. But if we are moving towards a world in which we eat less meat, one of the best sources of non-flesh protein is also derived from fungi, whether as straight mushrooms or compounds such as, well, I suppose tofu and corn. Um, I don't know if you have corn in, in the States, as if it's sold under that name. Those filamentous mycelium, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of, of potential uses of fungi for a world where there is there are strains being put on meat production taking up rainforests and plains of america and you know, wherever it might be you know there are good things that can be done with mushrooms and so yeah but i, I suppose i would go back more than anything to plastic substitutes being the most single exciting thing out of everything I think that is a hope that so many people also latch on to when you learn about the potentials of fungi to replace materials is the light bulb goes off and you think, oh my Lord, we can have a world without plastics or maybe a fungi that eats the existing plastic we're getting buried in. I mean, 
yeah, there's these huge, and that's why I love asking this question is there's so much kind of utopian potential that's possible. And I always love to hear guests like yourself elucidate that. And it, I think it gets us all really excited and leaves us with a lot of inspiration. Well, I think, uh, I think well, you, you've made a very good point, actually. I mean, the, the plastic eating fungi are also, I mean, given the problems that we've got with oceans full of plastics and fields and, you know, everything full of plastics and like if you can actually um harness fungi to kind of clean up the thing i mean that's brilliant yeah well and it sounds like this is something we've talked about the whole time but there's also this shift going on culturally where by appreciating fungi by appreciating wild mushrooms that we can eat we start maybe getting ourselves back in better balance with the ecology and the environment all around us so yeah, some hugely inspirational potentials possible, both on this bigger macro level and to each individual person as well. Really exciting. Well, Daniel, I just appreciate you coming on the show, sharing your unique, well-thought-out perspectives about even topics like the history and origins of foraging and culture. I mean, really interesting. As someone who loves history myself, getting to talk with kind of a more properly educated historian is always really enlightening. So thank you for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. And a pleasure to speak with you too. All the best and good luck. 